All glory to God. We're going to do a great Jesus cheer, all right? And I want you to say the name of Jesus. And finally, when we get to the end, and I say, what are you going to do with Jesus? You'll scream out, go, 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 all right? Give me a J. That's not good enough. That's not loud enough. Are you really in love with him? All right, say that name that will be echoed through every land and every nation. The name that is above every name. The name of Jesus. Say it now. Give me a J. to the Father, Jesus. whose name is above every name. Jesus. What are you going to do with Jesus? Go! 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 Hallelujah! Turn around and hug somebody. Tell them you love them. And you may be seated if you can. Helping me lift up that cross was Joshua, my son, who has been traveling with the cross all of his 28 years around the world and now is an evangelist himself, carrying the cross with his wife, doing crusades, preaching in churches and cities, and training people in witnessing. Thanks, Joshua, for helping me lift it up one more time. And sitting beside Joshua there, and also helping me lift up the cross, is Denise, my wife. Raise your hand, Denise. We have been married. We have been married for nine and a half years, and we've never spent a day apart. We've been in jail together. We've been uh, in wars together, and it's a thrill that both of them could help us lift up the cross. I want to begin by sharing a passage of Scripture, and this passage of Scripture is very short didn't need to be very long because it's loaded with power because it's Jesus that is speaking and Jesus said these words at the end of the book of Matthew go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person I love to do Bible studies with my wife. We read the Bible every night. And she always laughs at my Bible studies. Because what Denise will do, she'll always say to me, now, Arthur, what does that verse mean? And I will look very profound, and I will say, well, Jesus said, go. That means go into it doesn't mean around about it means go into all that means all that means all the world and preach that means Tell people about Jesus. Share with them the good news of Jesus to everybody. And 
And she'll say, is that it? Well, that's just what it says. I said, well, that's what I believe. That's the beginning of my theology. That is the end of my theology. Jesus said, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person by the grace of God. In 1969, Jesus spoke to my heart one night at 5 o'clock in the morning while I was preaching a crusade in Garland, Texas at the Garland Stadium. I was the minister of Sunset Strip on Hollywood's Sunset Boulevard. We had a Jesus coffee house where the cross was hanging on the wall of our building. But that night after I had preached in the stadium in Garland and had preached in the cellar nightclub here in Dallas, a real funky, gross nightclub that I preached on stage as people were hollering and hooting and the girls too and people got saved in that nightclub, went back to my room knelt down on my knees and Jesus said pray the rest of the night and at five o'clock in the morning I was 29 years old at the time and Jesus said take the cross hanging on the wall of your building and put it on your shoulder and carry it on foot across America and then into the world and identify my message in the streets where the people are. And that night in September 1969, right outside of Dallas at Garland, I said, yes, Jesus, I'll do it. And by the grace of God, Christmas morning 1969, after having been in the hospital with a brain aneurysm two weeks earlier, and the doctors saying, you can't get excited, you can't lift anything heavy, we may, you may need brain surgery. I put the cross on my shoulder. Pastor Gwen Turner at Marina Cathedral in Los Angeles prayed for me. And in the name of Jesus, I said I'd rather die in the will of God than live outside of it. Took one step down Sunset Boulevard and started walking. And I said, I want to give my life to do what Jesus told me to do. Because my motto has always been, whatever God tells you to do, do it. And I, if I'll die facing New York, I'm headed that direction. And in the name of Jesus, he gave the strength to walk one day. And then one week. And then one month. And then one year. And then five years then 10 years, then 20 years, then 25 years, now 30 years carrying a 12-foot cross around the world. And by God's grace, we have lifted up the cross in every nation on earth. All glory to God have carried the cross in every sovereign nation, almost every island group and territory, 278 nations, island groups, and territories have been in jail 24 times, have been in 49 nations at war, taken out to be shot before a firing squad, have been now over 33,300 miles on the roadside. It's in the Guinness Book of Records as the world's longest walk. And by the grace of God, I stand before you. I don't have an ache or a pain. By the grace of God, I never felt better in my life. And I'm 58 years old and going strong. Jesus did it. He said, go all power is in his hands and the reason that he introduced my feet is because although they've gone over 60 million steps with a 12-foot cross there's not a bone there's not a bunion 
There's not a callus. My feet are absolutely perfect. Jesus did it. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. I'm saying that to brag on Jesus. When he said go, he said he would be with you always into the world. So now, my friends, the question is not where we go. Jesus has already told us that, hadn't he? The question is not what we're to talk about. It's him. The only thing that is yet to be decided is how. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. How do we go? How do you witness? David has been sharing techniques wonderfully, David. How thrilled I am to be identified with you as you're teaching and reaching out. But how? Say how. how? That's the only question. How are you to be a witness for Jesus Christ? Jesus said, all power is given unto me. And then he said, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. How are you to do it? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Turn it over to Jesus. I say all the time, Lord, this is your world. You care more about these people than I do. I love them. I hurt, but you love them before I ever loved them. You died on the cross for them. I don't ever plead for God to save anybody. He wants them saved more than I do. I pray that God will send witnesses into this world. That's what Jesus said. He said, pray the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. See, it's not God that's got to get convinced to save the world. It's us. We're the one that has to be moved by the Spirit of God. So we need to be set free. In 1981, my daughter Jenna and I were traveling carrying the cross in West Germany. And we went on to Berlin for a great rally at Olympic Stadium, Berlin Airlift. And there, tens of thousands of Germans gathered in Olympic Stadium in West Berlin, in free West Berlin, surrounded by communist East Germany for a great Jesus rally. I was one of those speakers, and as I was invited to speak, God told me what to do and said, don't tell anybody but one friend, and I needed his help from Johannes Swalini. The platform was in the middle of the stadium on the soccer pitch, and the stadium with the thousands in the stands. I carried the cross out, and then I preached. But at the end of my sermon, I said, now I'm going to carry the cross across the field, up the stairs, up the stadium to the top, and lift it up upon that pinnacle where Hitler had opened the 1936 Olympics for the glory of man. And so I left carried the cross up there to the top of that stadium and at the top there is a narrow concrete platform that goes up and a torch is up on top and Johannes helped me climb up this concrete thing and then he handed the cross up and I hooked it over the top standing on this little perch if I'd fallen I'd have been killed then I helped him get up there and we lifted the cross up. 
And there the cross was lifted above Berlin, and all around was communism, atheism, the Iron Curtain. And I prayed. Then we came down. And then Jenna and I later were driving the car with a little trailer behind it down the road back into free West Germany. There was only a small road with barbed wire and barricades on both sides. There was a corridor between West Berlin and West Germany. Driving down near the border, the car broke down. And when the car broke down, I was praying for the Lord to heal it, that it didn't crank. And then I got louder and longer. It still didn't crank. And they were cursing in German, finally pushed us off the side. And, and then in the middle of the night, Jenna's asleep. I'm laying in the floor of the trailer praying, Lords, why have you broken this down? What are you trying to tell me? See, I look for God in every circumstance. Lord, what are you trying to teach me? And as clear as anything in my life, Jesus spoke to me and said, Arthur, you've been praying about getting behind the Iron Curtain. Well, you're behind it and you can't get out. I felt so embarrassed as God showed me where my faith was, right? I want to get into communist East Germany, into the communist world. Here I am, broke down on the highway. Can't get out. And then the Lord said to me, there are no walls. The iron curtains are in your mind. There was no such thing as an iron curtain until Winston Churchill, speaking in America, in Missouri, in 1946, said with this gravel voice, an iron curtain has fallen across Europe. And then preachers started preaching iron curtains. Theology schools began to teach iron curtains. Mission plans changed to draw circles around the iron curtains. We quit believing what Jesus said. We called ourselves people of the book and the Word of God. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person except the Iron Curtain because you know you can't get behind the Iron Curtain. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to everybody except the Muslim world because you know you can't get into the Muslim world. Go into all the world and preach the gospel except China. You can't get into that communist world. And so we learn to draw circles of exclusion where God could not work. And it's not over. Read any religious magazine current today and they're talking about the 1040 window where you can't evangelize. I've carried this cross in every country in the 1040 window and preached Jesus openly. These walls are in our mind. There is no 1040 window. The only window there is is wide open. Jesus said, go. And I tell you, friends, we've not just drawn those circles around the world. We've drawn them around our communities. We've drawn circles of unreachable peoples by ethnic and racial communities. People that'll go out triumphantly for God on one street wouldn't dare walk into another neighborhood. We've drawn those walls around lifestyles and we've excluded people who are and have had are involved in abortion or homosexuality or drunkenness or drugs or the country club are the rich neighborhoods, are the rich communities, 
We've drawn circles and said, well, we'll go everywhere except there. Those people are too hard to reach. Those people, they won't respond. Everywhere I go, people tell me this is the hardest town that there is in the world. You've done things those places, but you can't go there. People ask me, oh, Arthur, when you went into Libya, did you feel the devil? Did you feel the demonic power in that country with Muammar Gaddafi in it? Everywhere I go, I feel the glory of God because he's with me. People say, do you ever see revival spirit breaking out anywhere? I say, yes, everywhere we go, right, Joshua? Right, Denise? Everywhere. And so much for those people in Libya that are supposed to be so bad. We couldn't pay for a thing in Libya. Gaddafi paid for it all and sent an airplane to fly Joshua and I to see him in the middle of the desert. So much for all these off-limit zoned places. People said, don't carry the cross in Israel. They'll get upset. I've carried it three times. I've walked from Beirut to Jerusalem. I've walked all around Israel, the West Bank, the East Bank. I've carried the cross from Jerusalem to Cairo. I've carried it all through the Bible lands, all the way through uh, in uh, Iran and Iraq. All of these places in Israel, I kept my cross in Prime Minister Begin's house one night. His dog bit me on my arm. I still have the scar. General Rafaeli Taunt came out and welcomed me carrying the cross and had me a week in the Israeli army bases preaching with the cross. You say, but the Muslim world will be upset. I spent three different times. I prayed with Yasser Arafat. Joshua and I walked into Beirut as he was 12 years old. And Yasser Arafat's brother, Dr. Arafat, we had time after time, night after night in that war, Bible studies. And he, Joshua, would fall asleep and he would carry Joshua back to this old beat-up hotel we were staying in, in his very arms. And I prayed with Arafat in Beirut, 1982. And even this year, prayed with him again in Washington, D.C. I'm telling you, my friends, the world is open. There are no walls. Last year, we carried the cross in Iran. We carried the cross in Iraq, twice in Iraq. We carried the cross in Saudi Arabia. And the last country was North Korea, the most closed nation on earth. And yet today's newspaper said in the Dallas paper that now Clinton has lifted the embargo on North Korea. And, but we were in there last year with the cross and they gave us our invitation in a red velvet folder. There are no walls, they're in our minds. But not only are they there, around things and places, they're there around our own excuses. We built walls around ourselves. Some of you have separated yourself from the service of God because you said, I backslid and sinned, so I'm no more of use in the kingdom of God, and you went back home. So you've drawn the circle. You pray for the world. You cheer preachers. You love God, but you don't witness because, well, I fell. So now you've got an excuse that's a crutch. You've drawn a circle around yourself and disqualified you, so no longer do you have a responsibility to God, to others of the world, because you failed. And you use that as an excuse and crutch to keep from doing the will of God. There are not many characters in the Bible whose lives didn't have some horrible flaw in it. Start all the way back from Noah and Abraham and on through to Moses and David and Samuel, I mean, and uh, Solomon, and right on down to the apostle Paul 
and right on, he was killing Christians and right down to Peter who backslid. Every one of them have scars and mars, but God got them to get their eyes off of their failures and onto him, and he used them, and that's what you need to do. Some of you have said, well, I'm divorced. God can't use me. So you quit preaching and you quit serving God and you found you an excuse that alleviates yourself of responsibility. You say, well, I've still got a problem. I still smoke or I still drink too much or I still do something. And so you eliminate yourself. And God is crying out, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Woe am I, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And the angel came and put the tongs of fire upon his lips and purged him. And he answered and cried out, Here am I, Lord, send me. What we need in America are saved sinners filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. who say, I'm not proud of my sins. I'm not proud of the failures of my life, but all oh, glory to God, I've been washed in the blood of Jesus, and He saved me, and I'm going to the whole world to tell and to live. God has mercy on sinners. So the only question is now, how? How do we respond? How do we go? The Lord told me one time to carry a cross from Mexico to South America. That's a long trip. I've been on many of those long ones. But finally wound up in Panama after a firing squad experience that Paul and Jan have shared many times and is in one of our videos. But my point here is the Darien jungle. When I arrived at the Panama Canal, the American commander said, you can't carry the cross through the Darien, 400 miles of almost impenetrable forest, five-layer forest, different vegetation at each level. The sunlight didn't even reach the ground. Here are the aerial photo maps. You can't even see the rivers because the vines and trees overlap, deep, steep cliffs, ravines, going from the steep mountains right into mangrove swamp. Only a few hundred people have ever gone through there, and you can't get through with a cross. You need to go back, and if you're going to try, get a team. Try to be normal. Get a group. Go in. So one of the few times in my life I tried to be normal. I came back. What do normal people do? Well, they play tennis. So I got out there and somebody said, Love 15. I said, No, it's Love John 316. <laughs> Nobody wanted to play with me. Tried to play golf. Started putting these Jesus stickers in the little cup holes and they got upset on the golf course. Thought I'd try the swimming pool and all I wanted to do was baptize. Well, I tried to get my, I got three, two friends to go with me. They're still friends of mine, but they were healthy and good and tough, and one spoke great Spanish, and one was a veterinarian doctor, and we went back. And there we went to the Sherman Survival School that the commander had arranged, where they trained the Green Berets and Air Force pilots in jungle survival. But it left after one day, because I'd already walked across Africa, and they try to get you to hide out. Well, we're trying to be known, right? Uh, we're trying to get into the villages, not survive in the jungles without seeing anybody. So when I got ready to leave, I said to my two friends, I said, now all the way, all the way together, right? And they said, right. But I learned better than to trust Christians, you see. Uh, because Christians rededicate so much, they don't have to keep their word. All you do is go forward the next week and you're in great shape. So after the road turned from the highway at Panama City into finally gravel and then dirt, and the dirt into a trail, and bad feet and sore backs, one of my friends said, 
we're going to die in here. It's true what they said. They said, I got a family. I said, I do too. He said, well, I'm going back. So we went, he went back. And me and my other friend went on. And finally, I mean, this overwhelming feeling in this jungle begins to almost overwhelm you. And finally, there is no trail. And with machete, we're cutting. And finally, this river pouring down and roaring water. And there are no trails between. The Choco and Kuna Indians go down. They don't cross from one village to another even without going down the water. And my veterinarian doctor friend, he looked, he said, we're going to die. All we got to do is take a boat and go around. I said, but Jesus said, walk. He told me, walk from Mexico to South America. I don't have any choice. It's not if, but how. And he laid down every bit of our supplies, their snake bite kits, in case the Fertilance and Bushmaster snakes strike you in the face. You gotta have a shot within a few seconds. There's all the splints and everything for broken bones. I finally, I said, man, I can't carry the cross and all this gear. Can't carry the food. Finally, what do I need to survive? I need my cross. I need my Bible. I need a hammock to hang up at night in the trees, get off the ground, two canteens of water. I don't need any food because I can fast or live off the land. I'll keep a roll of Jesus stickers. <laughs> That's it. I need my machete. And my friend turned away. And I turned toward the water and looked at that towering jungle, hundreds of miles of it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, if God wants me to see Columbia, I'll arrive alive. But the devil isn't killing me in here. In the name of Jesus, I'll see the other side. And I walked into that water and never looked back. How do I get across this river? How do I get up this steep ravine? You get the cross up. I hook it on vines. I climb. I hook it again. And I climb up and finally everything breaks loose and here me and the cross come down called lamb and you're muddy and dirty in the name of Jesus there's a way to get this cross up to the top of that ravine and you get up there and there's a way through and you cut and you hack when I got into Columbia bearded dirty six weeks later even the muggers and the drunks were scared of me. I came walking in with my machete and this cross. Jesus did it. How? How do you reach your city? How do you lead people to Jesus? Not if. Am I going to? Yes. How? Lord, show me how. There is a way. I have lived my life doing what people have said you can't do. Last year we couldn't get into Iraq. No way. Nine years of trying until finally Denise said, let's just go. And we went to Iman, Jordan, and we got a guy to drive us near the border, put the cross together, started walking. And in the name of Jesus, the Jordanian commander said, I don't know why I'm doing this, I'll let you through. And he led us through into no man's land to Iraq. And there, Denise with a British passport, me with a U.S. passport, Iraq's two biggest enemies had been fighting them and we're still bombing them. And we walk up to the border with this very cross and say, we want to come into Iraq and pray for you in the name of Jesus. And they're talking on the radios and finally, the guy says, you mean just inside the border? I said, inside 
right there under the big banner of Saddam Hussein. Okay, they said it's okay. And we go in and I pray and Denise is talking to the soldiers that are gathering. And finally, when I get through praying, I stand up and they said, you're wanted at the VIP headquarters. And they're sending a car. I said, we don't ride, we walk. And so they assigned a soldier to guard us on our walk. And we walk to the VIP headquarters. And the minister of the Iraq government in charge can invite me. And I gave him my card. When we got back to Fort Myers, Florida, where we live, there was a phone message, and the Iraq government invited us to carry the cross in Iraq. And they provided transportation from Amman, Jordan, to Baghdad. And we carried the cross in Baghdad. And we carried the cross in Babylon and stood it above the walls of Babylon, the seat of Satan, raised it up in the name of Jesus. And then we carried the cross in the Ur of the Chaldees where Abraham was born and called by God. I'm telling you, there are no walls. What do you do? You go, not if, but how. Just over two years ago, trying to get the cross through Pakistan into Afghanistan, militant Afghanistan, no functioning government, war all over the place, and we couldn't get a visa in. We tried the Khyber Pass. They wouldn't let us through, so we did a Jesus fake off and went up into the Chitral, to the city of Chitral and the Chitral Valley and got a guide and two porters, all Muslims, and said, we need your help to help me over the Hindu Kush mountains with my wife to carry the cross into Afghanistan. And they said, yes. And we, Denise went 26 miles on a donkey. And finally, the cliffs reached too high and the steep cliffs. She said, Arthur, I can't go any further right now. She stayed with some other women tending sheep. And I went on with these two guides and, I mean, one guide and two porters. And it was steep cliffs. One slide is your death. We climbed 18,200 feet high across two glaciers with no ropes. If Saeed didn't fall in and die, we went his way. He went first. We had to unbolt the cross and carry it in pieces because you can't climb on these steep cliffs with the whole cross like this. Got to the top and bolted it together and into Afghanistan. But what I want to say is that 18,200 feet, that's higher than any mountain in America except in Alaska at Mount McKinley. The oxygen is so thin, <laughs> you can't breathe. And it is so tough. And Saeed said, take small steps. And I would take small steps. And I look up, and it's just wall. And you can see way up there, thousands of feet ahead, is the top. And look down, and you, uh, All I could do was I pull my cap down to where I could only see 10 feet in front of me. And I said, in the name of Jesus, my whole mission is to make it 10 feet. And I would crawl and climb until I got to the end of my cap and look up and there was another 10 feet. And I went on and on and on until without being climatized, which it takes weeks to do at that altitude. When I got to the top, the porters and the guide were all wanting to fill my legs and they were saying, it's a miracle. I can't believe you did it, but Jesus did it. My dear friend, how do you win this world of Christ? How do you become a witness? There are days when you've got to pull your hat down. There are times, pastors, when you pull it down, don't you? 
I love that song Chris Christopherson wrote. Janis Joplin used to sing it too. Lord, help me walk one more mile. Just one more mile. The longest journey in the world is one step at a time. You can be used of God. His power is available for you in your life. How do you do it? When I was seven years old, a traveling evangelist led me to Jesus in a car park. I'm so thrilled that God saved me in a parking lot. See, he was training me to lead others to Jesus outside the buildings. And I didn't even, I don't even know his name. And Jesus, by that, showed me it's not the follow-up, he'll follow up. And the next day, the next morning, I led my sister to Jesus who's still serving God. And my dad was drinking heavily in bars and nightclubs. Many times he'd stick a tire wrench under my shirt for me to carry. So if he needed a, in a fight in the bar, he could pull it out. I sat helping steer him home. During the time I was a kid, I had pulled chairs together in the bar and I'd lay down and go to sleep. I heard all that goes on in all that life. But I was saved at seven, and I started gathering up gospel tracts, and I'd pass them out in the bars. They weren't such great tracts like we have today, David, but ten reasons to tithe, <laughs> why Baptists don't dance. And I, I'm laying them all around the, the place. And somebody would say, what in the blanky blanks this doing in here? And my dad would say, that's my son. Shut up and leave him alone. And dad let me do all the witnessing I wanted to do as a kid. One night when I was 13 years old, he came home drunk, stone drunk. And I was waiting up, and I started talking to him again like I'd done hundreds of times. And dad said, I want to pray tonight. My mother, who's 91 years old and will probably see this program, still praying for me. My mother and my sister, Virginia, we gathered around Dad and the couch, and my dad gave his life to Jesus Christ. He got up a new man. He said, I'm not ever going in the bars again. I said, Dad, that's not right. You need to go back and tell what Jesus has done in your life. And he got the big family Bible, and he started going with me back into the bars, leading men and women to Jesus Christ. So I have a burden out there for people who are not in church, but who are beautiful people like my dad, who need Christ. But when I was a child, seven, eight, nine years old, we, my dad managed a plantation. It was over a mile on the other side of the cotton field. Many times my job was to carry water, and I'd carry the water in the big buckets. And I know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and I'd walk that line. But the Jesus would speak to me. And he'd say, Arthur, I want you to turn right, and I want you to walk and go like 50 steps to the right, and then turn left and go 75, and then turn around three times, and then go another direction. And I'd wander around the cotton field, and Jesus was speaking to me. And I didn't understand it. And I'd say, Lord, I want to get over there on the other side. I, I, if anybody knew this, they'd think I was crazy, Lord. But he'd say, I'm telling you, hear my voice, do what I'm telling you to do. One day, my dad caught me way over on the other side of the cotton field. And he said, what are you doing over here? And I said, well, Jesus has been telling me to go left and go right. And he said, I'm telling you. I won't tell you what he said, but... 
if I ever catch you over here like this and I went crying on over to the cotton choppers, because do I obey God or my dad? What do I do? But I want to tell you that that is how God has led us around the world. Over and over, God has said, go to this nation. And I pray over maps. I lay and I pray and the Lord will listen. Praying and the Lord will say, go down this road and I'll mark it. Then turn down, go this way. This is the way I want you to walk. Time and again, I've had gunmen standing in the road pointing back. You've got to go back. And I say, but Jesus sent me here. And I start sticking stickers on them and start praying for them. And in a few minutes, we're drinking coffee. And I'm on the way. And Joshua's seen it. And Denise has seen it. And we've seen gunmen whose gun were pointed at us. And you come up to them. What are you doing? Carrying a cross with a message, God loves you and Jesus died for you. Remember, Joshua, that soldier of the Syrian army took off his badge and pinned it on. He said, you're the toughest man I've ever seen. And he was standing there with fighters to carry a cross like that to the battlefield. What I want to tell you is this. Jesus, when you're going in the way God sent you, when God says and his voice speaks from heaven, Arthur, I want you to carry the cross in Libya. I want you to walk through Iran. Every angel, all the glorious powers of God, every cherubim, every seraphim is at your disposal to get God's mission done. Now, if in my own mind I decide I'm going to take a side trip and go over here and do this because it's a good idea, all the angels, they say, I don't have any authority to go over there. I don't have any power over there. There's power when you go where God tells you to go. And when God gives you a burden for a street, go to that street. When God gives you a burden for a city, go to that city. And if you can't fly there, drive there. If you don't have a car, then hitchhike. If nobody will pick you up, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. And if you can't crawl, say, find the direction that place is you're supposed to be and fall in that direction. But do what God tells you to do. He wants to use you. He will do it. How? God told me to walk across Africa, 1973. I get off of a boat in Freetown, Sierra Leone. Nobody knew where I was, where I was going but God because, I mean, I was standing at a port every day in the Canary Islands trying to find the first ship to Africa. Step off the ship and a man says, Welcome to Africa, Arthur, bless it. And I said, how did you know I was coming? I said, well, we saw a cross come off the ship with a wheel on it. And I figured that was you. And I said, well, I'm here. He said, come spend the night at my house. And my dear friend, Phil Cheadle, who I got an email from the other day, still friends after all these years, but he, say, he began to tell me how, as a missionary, he said, Arthur, you can't eat the food here in Africa. You'll have all these diseases and parasites, amoebas, worms, everything. You can't drink the water. You can't eat the food. You can't even bathe in the water. You'll get these parasites in your eyes, all kind of diseases. He said, you can't. And man, I mean, I'm in paranoia. But, but, Lord, you told me to walk across Africa. And I'm laying in this bed at his house my first night and under a mosquito net and a little lantern burning. And I opened my Bible to Luke, the 10th chapter. And Jesus was saying in that chapter, go your way. Enter into the first house that asks you. Eat and drink whatever is set before you. Go not from house to house. 
heal the sick and say the kingdom of God has come near. And with fear and trembling, I clutched my Bible and I said, Jesus, I'll do what you said. And now it's up to you. If I get sick, I can't walk. So I'm trusting you to keep me well. You can kill all those diseases before I ever get sick. He said, enter into the first house. Go not from house to house. That means don't look for the best deal. If they're poor, stay with them. If they're rich, stay with them. Whatever color, language, religion, anything, enter the first one. Eat and drink whatever they put before you and heal the sick. Say the kingdom of God has come here. And I'm here to tell you, by the grace and power of God, as I ate my way across Africa and around the world, drank my way many a meal I looked at, not saying it out loud, but my whispered prayer is, Lord, kill them all. I have eat food I did not want to touch. I have drank water. I pushed back green scum in holes and drank water because you got to have liquid. In the name of Jesus, kill them all. And by God's grace, I never had worms, amoebas, even diarrhea in all these countries we've walked around the world. I will be with you. He will be with you as we go. He will be with you on this journey to the world. Now, how do you do it practically? Let's start at your home, okay? This will be broadcast around the world. And a special thanks, as David has already said, but to Paul and Jan Crouch for the vision and burden to televise this through the TBN network to nations around the world, every place viewing this. The cross has been in your country. Wherever you go, from now on, in all of history, the cross will have been before you. You can't go anywhere to any country. The cross hadn't been lifted up in it already. All glory to God. If you would like to know Jesus and invite him into your heart, please pray this prayer with me now. Dear God, I need you. And as best as I know how, I give you my life. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins, arose from the dead and ascended into heaven. I repent of my sins and welcome Jesus into my heart to be my Lord and Saviour. Write my name in your book and make my home in heaven. I am not ashamed of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer and saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.